Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of 18 Avenue Podcast. I am your host, Rico Bottles. Today's guest is a friend, a brother from another country, a senior corporate account representative at Secure Energy, Brian Richardson. We will be discussing sustainable energy, innovation, and education, the good, the bad, the ugly. Let's get to it. Let's start with uh, sustainable energy, just to. Um, what is your passion? Where, where does that come from? Well, for me, I was uh, lucky enough to be born in Calgary. And uh, my dad was a geologist. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm kind of, and I'm, I've worked most of my life in the energy industry. Even in the 80s, I was helping my dad with stuff. And most of my career has been in the energy industry. So, for me, you know, I just feel blessed to be in that industry, you know, and to be second generation in our whole city, our whole province. I mean, it's just, we're just so hooked up by managing billions of dollars of these natural resources. Mm-hmm. You know, few cities, few provinces, few countries get to do this. You know, the ratio of how few people there are here and how many resources, mm-hmm. you know, like right. you were born in a different place and uh, not every country has this problem about how much can we export as fast as possible. That's our energy dilemma. Mm. You know, that's not a real dilemma for it's other places. Real... It's like, we need energy, right? <laughs> like, right. So it's yeah. like, so I just came, I just come from a very privileged place and kind of recognizing that um, I'm just so lucky and um, so then you look at it when you're, when you're in it and you're like, okay, you know, I just want to make it better, right? Like just it, it help improve it. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty well known by now that oil and gas has some serious downsides, right? So Absolutely. the whole like climate change thing is a huge one. But, um, you know, I mentioned I work with a lot of engineers. I work with a lot of environmental scientists too, right. because, you know, when you work in a industry that tries to extract things out of nature and sell them, make, turn them into useful products, there's just so many environmental consequences in doing that. And so, you know, our industry's just steadily getting better at, at, at dealing with at getting the most value and, and creating the less, the least kind of negative externalities, right? You, mm-hmm. you don't want to have these negative um, consequences on the environment or, or outside society. You only want to bring positive. Absolutely. You know, so it's just a natural thing, I think, from um, being born into it and seeing some of the flaws and trying to help, you know, rather than resisting the change, right. really like, okay, well, trying to be constructive with it, within it and try and... Uh, I've always said that it's it's easier to move uh, move ideas than power. So I love that I'm in the center of this power base, right. trying to encourage good ideas to right. flow into it. Right. Yeah. I think I think that's pretty awesome. Now you mentioned um, the downside when you're just relying completely on what's already out there. And what would you say are some of you know, the concerns at this point, because the, the population of the world has changed, including that of Calgary as well. It wasn't long ago when it was just a million people. Sure. We've passed that now. Sure. Yeah, I think maybe so a, a, more. about a million people have moved to this city since I was born here 40 years ago. <laughs> Something like that. Like it's been an insane growth, you know, right. and just speaks to the one huge benefit of all this is just there's so much work to be done, right? So, so many people have moved to this city, this province. Um, I know I know people in the last few years complain about, like, relatively, it's not as good as it was maybe, like, four years ago when it was really booming. Right, right. But um, it's still, you know, you compare it to a lot of other cities or places in the world, and it's still such a privilege to manage the billions of dollars we do manage, even if it's billions of dollars less than, say, 2014. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, to talk about some of the downsides, you know, um, well, we mentioned climate change. That's a big one, right. I think, you know, like producing fossil fuels you know there's this i think we create a lot of the emissions i think about 20 percent of the emissions 10 to 20 percent are in the actual production Mm -hmm. of the fossil fuels and then of course you know the downside uh the um 
when people burn, the, most of the fossil fuels are produced to be burnt, which creates the, the bulk of the other 80% of that emission. So that's something that our whole industry is really struggling with because that just cuts to the fundament, fundamental core of producing fossil fuels. So it's really interesting as like the financial community now presses against us strongly, mm -hmm. um, won't invest in us in the same way that they would decades ago or even years ago. And so, yeah, the, in the last year, it's this huge push. They call it ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance, mm -hmm. where they're pushing on all corporations, especially oil and gas, to clean up their act. And uh, a lot of my clients, a lot of the biggest oil and gas companies in the province are now making the, in, including us, I'm working on our own internal ones, uh, making goals, setting out paths to try and be carbon neutral, right. which is pretty insane. Like one of the biggest players in uh, energy in Canada's uh, Canadian Natural Resources, mm -hmm. CNRL. And um, they made this goal a couple of years ago um, the same, I think it's about the same one that our nation has, where you're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. Right. So if you think of this giant oil company producing all this oil, mm -hmm. I don't know how they're exactly going to do it, but they've already they've already made great steps to reducing the carbon intensity of it. And um, but to be carbon neutral, that's uh, that'll be so transformative over the next 30 years. So there's a lot of work to do to to make CNRL and all our whole industry kind of more sustainable. Um, so that's one big one, climate. My company probably wouldn't even exist if if it wasn't for already really stringent uh, regulations around other types of environmental impacts. So namely like um, what, things to do with fluids and solids, not necessarily the emissions. The emissions, the gases are a bit new for us. Right. But... Um, so, so we kind of are this midstream company, and at Secure Energy, we're between the the producers and uh, trying to get their products to market. But you know, when you produce an oil and gas, you're not just producing oil and gas; you're actually producing mostly water. Right. And so we kind of split that apart. And this water is super salty, so it can't just be re released at surface. Mm -hmm. Um, because it would, it's a contaminant, so you can't have any kind of salt spills. Um, so it has to be deep well injected back into the formation. Mm -hmm. So we drill wells not to produce water, but to re-inject water back in. Um, and then things like there's spills, there's pipeline breaks, um, there's other waste types that, that come up during, like if you're drilling a well, there's this whole borehole of solids well, they used to just throw that in a pit on location and cover it up, and that was that. But now there's regulations that they have to keep track of every bit of waste, and it has to go to you know facilities like ours that have the proper lining and system so that you know this random bit of, say, really oily or salty water mm -hmm. or solids can't leach into a fresh water stream or something like that. So yeah, it's uh, th th those are some of the major ones. I think for me personally, some of the biggest, one of the biggest ones, you know, you hear about fracking. That's a big one. In the, in, so <laughs> yes. like, I don't think that's a big worry, like not in around where I'm at. I've seen gas land and, but you know, we're fracking at such depth that it won't really affect the, the surface groundwater in most cases, you know, like if you're a, a kilometer or two down, most of the fracks go kind of horizontally in, in the strata, not kind of up into groundwater, but we've drilled these big holes down in the planet. And so abandonment is, is a genuine issue, mm. you know, because the gas is unlikely to migrate through a frack, but through this giant hole, you drilled the actual well bore yeah definitely gas can migrate up through that and there's all these regulations to how to properly abandon wells but uh you know depends on when it was abandoned the regulations may be a bit weaker or the pro the techniques were a bit weaker so that's a really interesting one uh, that uh you know uh even there's this thing called the orphan well foundation mm -hmm. where um previous companies so there's some wells out there, tens of thousands, that aren't even owned by any company anymore. Yeah. 
And now there's, there's heavy bonds you have to put up and there's better regulations so that oil companies can't just go bankrupt and leave their kind of liabilities behind for, mm -hmm. on the citizens. But there's this thing called the orphan well foundation for orphaned, we orphaned wells, like wells that have like no orphan. parent companies. Right? I like that. <laughs> it's not funny, <laughs> but it's sad that they're kind of like these orphans are our responsibility right. as citizens. Right. <laughs> right. And it's, it's questionable. Um, yeah, we'll have to, con it's questionable whether it's funded for funded well enough for the, all the work we have to do. But I think they have, uh, they've made it more and more stringent over the years. So to make sure we don't digging ourselves deeper into that liability right. issue. But that, that's one of the big ones for me is well abandonment. Um, and I think, yeah, greenhouse gases, like climate change is just like, you yeah. see how like investors and just the general population is really crying out for change on, on that one. So they're right on that one, on that one. Um, I, I'm fully with them, you know, on fracking, I'm not, I'm thinking, well, it might be an issue in some parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's more of one that's just politicized a little bit and it's not as big as it is. The same thing with pipelines. Um, yeah, I got a lot of feelings on pipelines, but there's a lot of feelings on pipelines in the general community too, right? right? It's right. like that fracking thing. It's kind of that trigger point for the other side to just be like, no, we don't want a pipeline, even though it's the safest way to move fluids around, you know? Right. So we, you know, if you can, if you can take some volumes that are going on trucks or trains and put them on a pipeline, it's actually a lot safer, right? But at the same time, you know, I get that from the other side that um, someone who doesn't want the fossil fuel industry to grow, um, it's been a really strategic and impressive um, kind of political point against our industry to shut down the pipelines and then mm -hmm. and then bottle bottleneck us. And it's worked to some some extent. I'm, I think as a province, this is outside of secure, but it's really interesting to, for me to see how we're just getting more efficient with our pipeline use. Right. So we don't necessarily need more lines to Tidewater like everyone's been saying in, for, for years. If, if, we, if we ship um, more valuable products that are less volume, um, then in some cases we can use the current pipeline capacity you know we, we the, the optimization work that's gone on in the last year has been very impressive it's been the equivalent of bringing another pipeline on they've just mm -hmm. optimized the use of it and then there's certain projects coming up where you know instead of shipping this heavy oil with diluent all the way down to the gulf coast like our current a lot of the oil sands gets out that way. You know, there's all sorts of innovation about, well, maybe we can upgrade it to diesel fuel here. And that's a much smaller volume than the pipe, than the pipelines. We don't even need more pipelines or there's these cool solutions where they're putting it into puck, solid puck shapes, mm. can of pucks that, you know, so there's, it's cool that um, the oil industry is always oil and gas industry. Is, again, it's so wealthy. It's so powerful that they have the, the skill and the money to innovate. Right. So it's cool to see with these pressures, how we're reacting and uh, yeah, it's cool to be in the mix of that and try to feel like you're doing something. There's that sense of excitement. Yeah. And being productive and yeah, it's easy to get beat up, you know, feeling like, Oh, I work for the oil and gas industry. Right. I'm just polluting the earth. Uh, but there's a lot of us inside the industry that are gen genuinely have a good sense of, we're making a difference, you know, we're, right. like I said, with the power versus ideas thing, right? Like, um, if I can bring a good idea in, into here or, or help with a collaborate with a bunch of people to change a, a process to make something better, it's usually best for everyone. You know, it's it can often, um, help us and help, help us not hurt the earth, help us not hurt a local community, right. something like that. What an exciting show. I truly hope you're having a blast as I am. Is Canada doing enough to keep the environment clean? Coming up next. Yeah, that's some of the services we do is remediation and reclamation. So trying to... All that coming up in the next segment with Ryan Richardson. Uh, so many things you mentioned, um, including uh, just being able to... And this is something that I got to give Canada credit to is their ability and the laws, policies that they have in place for oil companies to make sure um, to keep the environment clean. Canada has been very, very strong on 
that point and you can see it when you're out in the field um you take an old an old um say a plant that is no longer in use you would never know at one point that these areas um used to be an operational plant site where you have all these different rate waste and things that are taking place but they've done such an amazing job at controlling it and rebuilding um you know for grains absolutely yeah, that's some of the services we do is remediation and reclamation. So trying to bring abandoned sites, you know, now we're talking the surface land back up to what it was like. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree. Like Canada has such stringent regulations. Um, it would be the best thing we could do on climate or another, a lot of other files is just export our regulations. You know, if other, if other countries, um, that's the whole thing with climate. You know, we all got to get on a consensus. They tried to do that at the latest um, global meeting in Rio de Janeiro about climate. Is they, they just can't agree on a, if we had a, a price to, for carbon on, with the whole globe, mm -hmm. it would be sorted. Right. You know, we, it's, it's tough nation by nation. But if we could export some of our regulations, absolutely. You know, it's, uh, we do a lot of things right here. There is a lot to be proud of. And the industry kind of is trying to say that as loudly as they can and using that as a rally cry. And it, and it really is true, you know, um, for my business, um, we can't work, we can't even operate in a lot of places in America because the regulations are state by state down there. So, you know, in Texas, a lot of our services wouldn't be, wouldn't be used because the, the producers aren't forced to, you know, they can flare natural gas down there, for example, in a way we can't, and I don't want us to, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, and, you know, even personally, I've got to work in a few different countries, half, maybe a dozen countries in the world. Right. And so places like, you know, Greece or Romania, you know, I've worked in, on rigs in these, in these places. And these are the kind of, I guess, the two that come to mind of the least safe places I've worked. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah safety is like a microcosm of the, of the broad kind of sustainability world. But, um, it's, I definitely agree with you that if Canada could export some of the way we do things here, which we, which we probably will over time, you know, yeah. and, and we kind of, we kind of do that already. We try and be leaders. Um, and then some people complain on uh, the economic consequences of that, having right. to do all this paperwork, having to, you know, you can't just do what you want. And so, you know, we lose out economically maybe in the short term, in some of it, but it's definitely as a citizen, I'm, I'm happy with that point and totally agree with you. Uh, now, my follow-up question today is you mentioned that you also worked in uh, Greece and Romania. Just looking at the two world, you're looking at Canada and you're looking at a place like Greece or Romania. Um, how is that experience? How does this experience compare? Is it like a day and night comparison or are we trying to compare it? Uh, apple to uh, oranges here at this point? Well, you're doing the same work. So like my job was pretty much the same wherever I worked. Um, but I was really into just the cultural differences. Mm -hmm. And for sure, there's some cultural differences. Um, but uh, yeah, so from the North Sea, for example, up in like Denmark or Netherlands, that was some of the safest places I ever worked. And, uh, and they just have a totally different culture when you're working offshore, uh, Greece and Romania. Oh man. Like some of the moments I remember one of the ones was just a social one. It's not even about, about work, but as, as on my very first day, as I go up to the drill floor with this Turkish guy, who's the driller, he's in charge of their operation. He grabs my hand just to hold my hand. So we could, as we walk up together to the rig site, we're holding hands you know, and, you know, <laughs> if he would have grabbed any of the other Dutch colleagues that I had, he, they would have had a different reaction. They're but I was kind of like, this is so cool. Like, this is so crazy. <laughs> and I already saw, you know, young guys walking around in Istanbul and all over Turkey doing this. So, it was, but I'm just like, oh, okay, cool. Right. Yeah. Like, so I just embrace it. And uh, at one point they invited me for this meal in the doghouse up on the rig. And, you know, it, I don't have too much, I didn't back then have too much of a hands-on role compared to these guys. And, and we're sharing this communal meal 
in the doghouse and there's no cutlery and I'm getting right into it again, a bit too much into it because I had food poisoning then for the next kind of like day and a half. <laughs> but, yeah, oh. <laughs> but yeah, the cultural differences were cool. Like that, the, the Canadian rigs are so macho yeah. and to see all the Turkish guys literally cuddled up on their break to watch football, yeah, it's, you know, is just different. Different and, experience. You know, every place I went was different, you know, it, in Romania also like, or no, that was in Turkey The these two experiences in Romania, it was just totally different set, you know, like wild dogs were kind of on me while I was trying to do my tools up and, <laughs> and like, sometimes I'd have to interrupt their operations. Um, cause I thought there was a safety concern, but, but they were actually just being dramatic in the way they speak because they speak much more dramatically. Right, so they right. were just catching up. And I thought they're uh, about to get to fisticuffs kind of thing. Right. So <laughs> I don't know. It's more the social things that I remember because the work is the same. Right. There, there is just different, you know, it was a shame in Greece. It was so sad because we weren't, we didn't have the, they didn't provide us. I was working for the Greek government then and they just didn't have the, it, it, you, when you come from Canada, we really do things so well. Like we do, as you said, take care of the environment well, but we're also just so effective and efficient. Right. There's this kind of get her done, work hard mentality right. that isn't in a lot of Europe. And, and we, it, so we weren't really set up for success in some places, right. you know? So I felt bad in Greece where we're doing this offshore rig and, and this rig has fallen apart, you know, like it's already been de decommissioned from the North Sea and they grabbed it before it could get scrapped in China. And instead of choppering in, we're on this boat. I'm literally like swinging on to the rig from a boat to the rig, like on a rope, like a Tarzan rope. Like, so I don't think that would fly wow. in the North Sea. Uh, and then, yeah, unfortunately, the result of all our work there. Um, wasn't very good. The, the, we kind of ruined this well because yeah. they didn't have the, they didn't spend enough money on important equipment that we needed. Um, so it was a struggle. I don't think my company even got paid. That, I worked for a different company back then, but I don't think we yeah, even yeah. got paid by them. <laughs> <laughs> As Calgary continued to feel the blow of unemployment. Dozens, dozens and dozens of people that uh, have been laid off. Cause I have one. What are your worries? Let's go back to energy. And and I know that there's a lot of opportunity currently that's being created. Things that slow down dramatically in this economy. There's a lot of guys that are off work and, you know, just because there isn't, there isn't any work, or at least they can't find a job. Uh, what is your take on that? Is that something that you, you could give a thought on? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know dozens, dozens and dozens of people that uh, have been laid off because I have one of these kind of, I'm always meeting with people, so I'm always networking. And so, you know, internally at my company, Secure, or my dealings with all the, the clients, I for sure, I've seen it shrink. The number of people has shrunk. We're trying to do more with less in the last four years. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I know a lot of people that have uh, been let go and maybe about like a third of them have... Uh, have landed somewhere else. A third of them probably are in like a better spot than ever. You know, they're doing something totally different and it, but it is painful for sure. There's a lot of personal pain. I don't, you know, I said earlier, it's still, we're still such a blessed city relative to other cities, I think. And even our industry, I feel like it's such a, it's such a, a great industry. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're still in it and, uh, but I, I don't want to minimize the pain of, 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 uh, you know, the, the struggle of if you did, did something and now you can't do it anymore. Right. It is rough. Right. So yeah, I definitely know dozens of people and it's not easy. There's not enough, there's not as many jobs to go around. And like I was saying, there's some different ones. So, you know, I'm always kind of looked in the future and I happen to work with a bunch of university kids. So I'm, 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 I'm looking at how I can, you know, pointing them in directions of where the industry is going. Like some of these big environmental challenges, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be future, future work. I've, I've, I know a few of my clients in just the last year have this new title around ESG, mm -hmm. you know, environmental, social, and governance. And, and a bunch of the people I work with wouldn't have jobs if not for the, 
the high bar of Canadian regulations, right? right? And regulations usually only go in one direction. They get more and more stringent, right? right? So there's new ones every year, and then there has to be new new people to do that work. So it's definitely different work. Um, there, if, you know, uh, I used to be a directional driller, right? and um, there's less there's less work there. I, I got really lucky going to kind of the... Uh, midstream and environmental side of the business five years ago, right. just because following my own passion. But it, it's a better space to be than, than drilling in this province right now. Absolutely. So yeah, it's it can be a lot of personal pain. I, I think there's still tremendous opportunity out there. We hope you're enjoying the show. Have you considered maybe a second career choice, or maybe a third or fourth? I know I have. Well, who's better to talk to than the man himself here with us today? He's done it. So let's go to him. One interesting one is, you know, there's, I'm, I'm focused on the tech kind of side of things. Okay. So like, you know, we could thread, you know, blockchain is a huge one for every industry, including ours. So there's, I mean, software engineers aren't, I don't jump to mind when I think of someone who can't get work, but right. there's always more work for software engineers and this oh, whole blockchain thing is just like gonna tra- gonna be transformative it might lead to more layoffs too you know as we automate things it might even lead, lead to more layoffs but uh jobs like mine where you're kind of like a liaison between people where you're just talking to people right i think those are always needed you know there's lots of sales jobs out there lots of liaison roles um other interesting things are, you know, if, if we're producing these hydrocarbons out of the out of the ground, well, as I said, some of them are viewed as valuable right now. Some of them are viewed as wastes. Right. And those things change throughout the years, you know, or throughout the regions. In Texas, they think natural gas is a waste product, and they flare most of it, and we try and use most of it, right? Mm-hmm. Or some of the future technologies like lithium batteries, for example. Well, there's a lot of lithium in the the stuff we produce too. So there's a company uh, in Alberta trying to extract lithium out of the production. Right. Right. Um, there's a couple of ventures I know about trying to produce hydrogen fuel out of the hydrocarbons. You know, we always think about the carbons and the oil and gas, the carbon chains, but hydrogen is a fuel too, right? So I don't know, I I got to work, one of the things that attracted me about working in Europe was I got to work in in geothermal energy. Mm -hmm. So you're drilling a hole in the ground, but then you're using the, the heat from the earth to either as direct heat or in some cases, if it's hot enough to spin a turbine. And so the geothermal energy is something that um, is also, you know, really cool. There's this company called ever, which is, uh, which is doing some cool things. A a company called deep in, in Saskatchewan that is trying to produce geothermal energy. So lots of opportunities out there, lots of different places we're going. It's, um, they probably don't all combine to the, what we've lost in the last four years. It was, we just came from such a high, you know, when, when the things we produced are, are valued, you know, oil and gas are just these major things we produce, but Alberta, Canada, we have everything. We have every kind of energy out there, right? So we have tons of coal, tons of oil and gas, tons of solar there's this new solar project um in vulcan being announced and it and it's and it's spurred on by spurred on by the fact that there's a big resource there and now that there's carbon pricing that's through the alberta tier system where it's getting funded because there's a carbon price right we have amazing wind energy lots of it it's really cheap um geothermal there's lots in the Yukon and Northwest Territories where it's needed. Uh, there's lots, you know, when you go to a hot spring in BC, you could you could easily drill for geothermal energy there. Right. You know, it's it, it, it's an interesting situation because we don't need energy. You know, we're trying to export it. So, um, companies like Ever, the geothermal one I mentioned here, I think 
you know, maybe they'll drill it here or maybe they'll drill it in other places of the world, right? Canada's always done that, kind of had, the, we manage resources not just in, in our province and in our country, but in others too, in other you know? As well. Yeah, so bringing tech, and that, and that can be, can be renewable energy too. It doesn't have to be oil and gas technology. So, and a lot of it's transferable. You know, when I was drilling geothermal wells in Europe, I was doing the exact same job uh, that I would have if I was drilling for oil or gas. And most of the Germans that I was working with on that particular job didn't care what we were drilling for. You right. know, it's like they're doing the same gig, right? It's, so. it's, it's the same thing. It doesn't change where you, what are you doing here or doing overseas? It's the same thing at the end of the day, yeah. as mentioned. When it comes to clean energy, Canada has, I mean, there's innovation everywhere, um, especially here in Canada. And the government has been very good at uh, funding and putting a lot of money behind these companies. Um, I guess my, you know, my question would be is, how are we performing on a global level? Hmm. Um. We're so small in a sense. I mean, we're this giant company, but we country, but we don't have a lot of people. So I don't know, relative to some other countries depends on the specific topic. You know, we were, we are still a big oil and gas exporter. Um, I don't think we really, I think we probably have some pretty impressive hydro capabilities, I would guess in like BC and uh, Quebec they get a lot of their energy from hydro. So maybe that gives some experience that they can help other places out with that. We traditionally have helped people out with oil and gas. So that's, you know, as according to climate where that's not the future, that's more the present or we're transitioning out of that. Nuclear is an interesting one, you know, like way back in the day we had this, um, do we have the, a lot of that? We had these can-do reactors. Mm -hmm. And so we actually, like 50 years ago, it's more of like an Ontario thing. And we still have some nuclear power, I think, out east. Um, and we had, yeah, we actually sold nuclear power, I think, to India and Pakistan. I think we helped them with the nuclear, rea nuclear reactors too, power generation. Um, and there's some really interesting tech with that, like the new generation of nuclear. It's such an interesting thing from an environmental perspective because right. it's clean as far as greenhouse gas emissions go. Right. But then it has this huge risk and it's been this, like, it was the one that environmentalists and people in general hated first, right? Nuclear, because it just has such power, but there's some new generation stuff there, um, where, you know, there's it's much less of a security risk. There's these thorium reactors that um, there's these new school reactors that um, eat old waste, eat old nuclear waste or don't produce new nuclear waste. So right. there's some really interesting stuff, but I guess Canada would be an interesting place to do it. We have tons of uranium, you know, like we have tons of everything. Um, I think, I don't know if we're a leader, you know, we, we get to be a small leader. You can't, there's this little brother <laughs> position. I just have, a, I, sometimes I struggle, you know, like we don't get a lot of the press, right? Like China and the U S are genuine leaders on so much of this stuff right? because they have these scales. So like China, the way China has brought down solar costs. So they're the leader at building coal plants and they're, they're also the leader at, at, you know, building solar power. So, yeah. And let's not forget Germany and, where, where they stand currently with, mm -hmm. I was reading that um, Germany planned to get rid of their nuclear program. Um, but I think by the year 2030, they they had it for like over 50 years. Um, and I believe that um, they're going to replace it with, uh, I, I think it's out of coal and natural gas. I mean, they're doing so well in this department that, you know, I, I was curious as okay where where is Canada position um in terms of this and I know like we we also focus a lot on the clean energy mm -hmm. especially with the United States since the announcement from uh the president um you know pulling out of you know the clean energy which then opened an opportunity gap for Canadians investors or innovators to kind of move in it's kind of like a niche thing and I think Canada is probably going to do 
I mean, we're doing well in that department. But globally, um, what I found was that we weren't performing as well, um, you know, in comparison. And I think one of the criticism was that we have all these um, companies that start from small and we build them and they get really big. And then for whatever reason, they just stall. They don't get any bigger than that. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And, and so, you know, I was just, this makes me wonder. Um, but I have a question for you because I know a lot of people um, that are in the field that I work in, I've been doing this thing for the last 10, 15 years. Um, he, here you are, you, you were in the field as well. You were drilling and doing all of that. And then you got this, where did the idea come from to get a career change? Where did it come from to say, you know what? I can drill for the rest of my life or I can go and do something else. How, how did I come about? I guess it was another sign of just how privileged I was and my background was where I could take progressive pay cuts on purpose to follow jobs that I thought would be better lifestyles for me or jobs that I was a bit more passionate at. So I've still never made as much money as when I worked out in the field right. when I was 25 or whatever. It's almost right? impossible, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I happily took a pay cut to go work in Europe. Um, and then I happily took a pay cut to get out of the field and, and work, go on the more business side in the office. And then I happily took a pay cut to go from the drilling and completion, the drilling world to the environmental and midstream world. So it's kind of a success of a success of pay cuts, but like, when you, I still feel like I get paid really well, mm -hmm. you know, and I always have all the way through relative. I've tried not to compare myself to the people right around me. You know, right. if I compared to myself to my direct neighbors, my friends I went to school with, you know, I've always tried to, to compare myself. You know, you look up the average Canadian salary you, and you know, I know growing up in Canada, Canada is a blessed place to be period, mm -hmm. you know, like, I've heard some of your stories about where you grew up, yeah. you know, like <laughs> different, different, I haven't yeah. looked up the stats about how much you make there yeah. per hour or per, per year. But if you, if you, if you try not to get caught up in this world that I started in, or even I'm still in where like, yeah, maybe he's making more than me or whatever, but I make enough for me and my family. Right. And so that frees me up a bit to make, to make the decision, I'm still trying to do it. I'm, I'm still pushing for this role within secure or just volunteering to do these things unpaid, you know? So for me, I feel like because I have all, you know, you can always use more money, but because I'm, I feel like I've always been pretty hooked up, then I can pursue what you really should be pursuing is like, right. what do you want to do and how can you affect change? And, and, or how can you find a job that works better for other aspects of your life? So me having two small kids now, I'm, I'm way happier in a downtown role talking about doing things than actually being out in the field doing them because that just takes me away, right? So that's Absolutely. I, I think you, that's so important. Um, one of the things that stick out with what you were saying was that you happily, and you used that phrase a couple of times to describe um, the position that you were in at the time and your willingness to make the decision is that you, you were happy. You saw that, okay, well, given your background, you saw that I think in the next 10, 15 years or so, things might be shifting more in this sector. So I am going to take a pay cut right now so that later on I am still good. And I think um, when you're in the field, you can't see your family. You don't see them. A lot of marriages as you know, it comes to the territory, yeah, it suffers, right? And probably ends. Worst case mm -hmm. scenario, most time it ends. And then everybody becomes sour, but you, you're, and I'm just wondering, what, what would you, what advice would you give to guys that I, that may be thinking on the line of, you know, maybe, because a lot of guys, I don't think they're willing to take pay cuts, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that the thought of them taking pay cuts truly scares them. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to anybody in terms of where they are now, especially if you are currently laid off, um, you know, you have no idea when you're going back to work 
And if you do go back to work, how long you'll be back at work before you get laid off again? What, what advice would you uh, give to an individual? Right. Well, for me, um, I would say the easiest advice is just start doing something. And it's one of the things that impressed me about you is that just start doing something you're personally passionate about. Um, and hopefully it's also better if, if you can solve, if you see some gap in the world that, that you can help, you know, volunteering in that space leads to kind of networking in that space, right. finding out more about it. You know, I've always been a huge volunteer over the years. I volunteer a lot of my time um, forever. And uh, just again, because I felt passionate about it and lucky enough to have the extra time to do it. And so even when I was working on the rigs way back in the day, I was uh, volunteering for the Green Party, <laughs> which is, like, I don't admit you that were? to many people. Yeah, way back in the day when wow. I could, only because uh, back then you got, and so I, I didn't run to win. I just ran so the uh, people could vote for me. Back back then you couldn't vote for the Green Party in every, in every place. So, right. so this allowed the constituents of uh, the, yeah, not too far from here, actually, because I grew up not too far from from here where we are now oh, okay. uh, to be able to vote. But that's a that's a long time ago. I, I just wanted carbon pricing back then. And uh, so, yeah, I explained to journalists on the phone that, it, you know, I'm out in the field right now drilling an oil and gas well, but I still think we should have this kind of thing. Right. Wow. Uh, so but that was my own personal thing. You know, yours is podcasting. Yeah. And, you know. You know, when I first met you, it was just like, this guy's just pursuing something, trying to help the world get out there, right? So um, some of the volunteering I do now is helping other people, university students kind of connect to industry and solve real world problems. So we try and be experiential. We don't try and just network. We try and actually get into some of the issues right. of our industry. And then, you know, maybe some of these young people can help solve these problems or maybe they'll find a career path, you know, there. Um, it's always, you, you'll put a little bit more effort into something you're passionate about. So, but, you know, I, I don't think I had any great foresight, you know, looking back, I, a lot of it was just luck. Um, and, and I'd also say that, you know, I, st I was initially attracted to the ener energy industry because of pure money. So my first job, I just went out there and I didn't love my job. I didn't love drilling wells, but, um, I was, so I was just doing it for the money. Yeah. And, um, so to take pay cuts from that. So that's why I just say it's, I, it was so blessed. You know, when I got out of university, they were just looking for warm bodies to throw out there. You mm. know, I didn't have, I didn't have to have any specific skill sets, maybe a little bit, but they were, it was a different market. Right. So they were, it was a good time to be coming out of university for myself where there was lots of opportunity. And I just always tried to do better. You know, I, it took me a couple of years, but after a couple of years I could replace two people on the rigs. So I was just, Hey, what, you know, what is this guy doing? So I'd learn how to be a directional driller while I was this MWD hand. That's pretty cool. You know? And then, and then when I became one, I didn't be like, ah, oh, now I'm a directional driller. I don't need to be an MWD hand anymore. I, I instead I went to my company and was like, I can do both. You know, let me do both. And that was super helpful. Having that skill set was just made my company money, but then it allowed me to go to Europe because then I could replace two Europeans on a rig. It's fascinating. Right? So it's just that extra work thing is, uh, I think, usually the advice. Follow your dream. Follow your path. It's not always just follow your dreams. Like, try and see a situation that's really useful for, for someone and try and pursue that. But the more interested you are in it, the more, the harder you'll work at it and hard work generally pays off, but it's a lot about luck too. You know, just, I can't claim that I had any good foresight and, or and most of it was just, I'm just a product of my situation. Good timing. Good timing, like incredibly good timing, man. Like I, I have such, uh, such deep re respect and gratefulness for when I was born, you know, yeah. where I was born, yeah. the family I was born into just, yeah. You know, you think about how many humans have lived on this planet. Not many of them had to had a cool experience like this with uh, talking and I'm, I'm immortalizing myself. You're helping me be immortal. I could die tomorrow and my family could still 
get a glimpse of me, you know, like there's so many different aspects of it, but like being born in Canada is a, is such a lucky thing being born in, in Calgary. Um, you know, I had a very supportive family and friends and school, I had just everything, you know? And, uh, and then the whole over time thing, you know, like I, I'm so soft. I wouldn't have been able to exist in this way. Right. Like I did like 200 years ago. Like how different was life? 2000 years ago you like imagine? most humans man like i don't know I, we I, we're like gods you know i feel like in comparison we literally have the power you know these little cell phones in our our pockets are omnipotent we can live for so long we can heal ourselves i mean it's just we can fly through the sky yeah. and send messages to people around the world like it is just insane. And so it, humans, we naturally kind of get used to it. I try and fight that a little bit and just be grateful it's, for how <laughs> godlike the, the whole feeling is and just how amazing it is to, to be alive. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is what you just said was that um, the other day I was thinking to myself, I'm like, man, we've come so far. We are like the most intelligent being on earth. And when you look at just the simplest thing, like if I wanted to send you a message, let's say you live out in Newfoundland and I want to send you a message. I want to say, hey, how, how are you today? Mm -hmm. The process alone, just to get that message to you, was crazy. Crazy. You need to trust a bird. <laughs> and you hope that the birds make it, how many birds actually never made it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then you get a message and find out, you know, your husband is, is alive or was alive in the war he's fighting, you know, like, and yeah, he, you get a glimpse. Oh yeah. He was alive two weeks ago, you know, and you get one, one of these every six yeah. months or something. Yeah. It's just crazy. So I have none of this. I have none of this. I've always, I've never ch struggled to survive. You know, it's only been this making the best out of it. And there's a lot of momentum. You know, they say we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Right. You know, that all the people that came before us have hooked us up in this incredible way. And, um, yeah, every, everyone on earth is really lucky. I think I usually just focus on how, how lucky I am specifically. But, no, I, 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 you know, and that's the thing. The very first time I met you, it was just this energy, this entire, you just... It's just like a, it's like a perfect package. You know, you meet somebody and you have, you exchange words with them once or twice and you kind of, as human being, we, we, you feel something, you feel something back because if you feel nothing, it just means that maybe this is not the situation. Right. <laughs> you just need to keep stepping. Right. right? Uh, but you, you feel something. And I felt that, I felt that in a moment about you. I'm like, no, he's not he's not your typical type of individual that you run across. Um, he's just, he just seems so much in control of where he is right now, where he's anticipated to be tomorrow and further into the future. And I was like, that man right there is solid. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I, it's rooted for me in gratefulness. I just feel so grateful that why not, you know, try and work a little harder at this or that or whatever to enjoy life a bit more, try and do a bit more, but I'm lazy too. Lots of times too, right? Like it's, I don't know. <laughs> we're human beings. Yeah. I, yeah. I think we're, we're naturally supposed to be somewhat, somewhat lazy, even though we don't, we don't admit that too often, but I, I try to admit it as often as I can, because <laughs> I find like the most I admit my laziness to myself the more this other side of me is like, oh, go do something now. And it's like, okay, I'll run to the gym. Totally. <laughs> totally. Like, you know, it's like, so uh, yeah. no, I think this is this such an important conversation because um, you, you think about sustainable energy and where we are now and where we want to go. It's such a, you know, it's hard. On top of that, we have a huge issue, which is, the climate change, and you can't talk enough, enough about that. Um, and the population is growing. And in the energy space, innovation is always threaded through everything. But 
Um, the fact that it's a university club brings out a different topic about innovation and education. And it's just, you know, I went, to, like I said, went to U of C and learned all this uh, mostly theoretical stuff. You know, like I said, I, my physics degree, I wasn't applied to the real world. And these days, education's way more like they want it, it has to be applied. You have to be, you know, experiential learning, applied learning is the new kind of buzzwords. And I, I felt that when I was at university, like just deriving math, like how am I going to ever use this? And I haven't used it much, right? It's just been a, a few letters that I could say I had um, some accreditation, but you know, I haven't really used it. And I think education, there's a big push right now, you know, whether it's our province and the new funding goals that they're under, um, whether it's technology and the way, you know, more people are maybe like, likely to get a certification by Microsoft than a degree in communications that is less applied. So there's just this big struggle about how do we educate people in the right way so that they're really set up to solve our current world problems. Right? right. So it's just such an interesting space. The, the universities are designed in a way that's really similar to what the way that they were designed hundreds of years ago, right. Where you actually have to memorize things and like this stuff isn't even important anymore. Right. right? right. It, it's more about gaining practical skills skills, meta skills, you know, learning how to communicate, learning how to solve problems. And then I think there should be a much deeper connection between universities, the general public and industry. So between universities and the general public, there's this, there's this total disconnect between, I don't know if you've ever tried to read someone's thesis paper or like a research paper, right? Like you, it's impossible. You it's just dry. Just ask it's, some PhD yeah. student what they're doing, yeah. And the mouthful they're going to give you right. is like all these fancy syllables and all these fancy words. It's so dry, and, and so there's a real opportunity to connect genuine research to the public. Um, and I think even your skills, man. Like uh, you know, I talk with my brother about he is, you having similar background as you. Um, he, a big passion for him is how do we, how can we facilitate that? You know, maybe, maybe it's videos, right. right? Maybe, maybe there's just an easier way to connect quality research with the real world. And then between the universities and um, the industry, similarly, you know, the, there needs to be strong connections in, in our city. I'd say SAIT is, is pretty good at that. Yep. Um, and that they have this applied research, even division where you can hire them to solve a problem. But, um, that's one example. And there's just going to be more and more examples of that where for, for going to school, you're not just going to learn about what some, some math someone did 150 years ago. You're going to be, you, you're going to be more tuned into how that's useful now and in how to apply it to the real world. So I'm interested in that space and kind of volunteer in that space and just see such tremendous opportunity there. And, you know, because I am tied with the university, I see, I see them, you know, really are threatened by this change and they want to embrace it to take advantage of it. So they're conflicted in a sense. They're threatened one. But at the same time, they don't want to miss out on the opportunity in, t in case this thing really like, because it is. I remember back in 20, uh, 2004, I think it was, uh, when the talk of online education had just started. And I remember being subscribed to The Economist magazine at the time. And I would read all the time about, you know, just the frustration and how society was so against that idea. And people, mm. the critics were like, Oh, it's never going to fly. It's never, ever going to fly. Oh, you're going to take, you know, you're taking jobs away from teacher. But actually, come to find out, they actually create a freedom for teachers. Because if you are an, an educator, you just film. You, you take three months, film the course. Mm -hmm. Now it lives forever. You never have to do it again. Right. The students can go on there if they have specific questions. They can interact with each other. They can help each other out. And I, as a student, can take my time to get to the lessons. 
you can watch it again if you need to right? watch it over and over again yeah. which is you know classroom facility especially me who come from africa the language it may all be english but the understanding the language barrier there's a gap sure the way you know um a education may may talk here and even the way they educate the kid might be entirely different but they're, they're unfamiliar with my background so they don't know how i would perceive certain educational information sure but then at the same time everybody is under the assumption that well well you're in the class you you are clearly capable of doing the work right and so there's always like that confusion but i think it's also like fascinating that you bring this up which i feel like it's it's an important part and you're right the educational system was 150 years ago mm -hmm. when it came up with it and it hasn't changed mm -hmm. now it's changing fast though and then they know it right so they have that whole flip in the classroom and maybe getting the lectures on video and using the classroom to actually connect with all the students and talk right. about it right is going to be a common theme going forward and there's lots of different techniques to to kind of evolve and innovate in education and make it a bit more fit for the real world or current world absolutely yeah and this is important so this is one of your one of your goal i don't know it's it's another cool right. thing out there that's just i mean it's also um it's so fun i, I, I find it's fun to volunteer yeah. you know because then in this case you know, everyone's there, not because they got paid to, right. You know, they're, they're there because they want to do something and, you know, it can be tough, you know, um, getting everyone's full commitment when they don't have to, they're not making a salary. So there's that, those issues, but it, volunteering can be pretty cool in a sense where you're, you're on a team that you're all there for pursuing a passion. And then when you're, when, and me, I'm volunteering for in this place where I'm trying to look into uh, innovation and all these exciting things about the future that are pretty cool anyways. Right? right. So I get to deal with all these, um, you know, 20 something students that are so impressive and so, so keen and, you know, more capable than me, than me in a, in a bunch of ways. So it's pretty impressive. And then, uh, yeah, helping them out to, uh, solve a challenge or connect them with, with an industry they might be interested in is, is reward and long term, right? So yeah. help someone out a little bit along the way. Yeah. Um, here, here's a question for you. How much um, room do you think that the schools are leaving um, for students to be creative? Is that something that's being encouraged or do you see it as still it being a taboo? Because I remember, you know, me in high school, that's like, what are you talking about creativity? What like? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, this old school educational yeah, system yeah, yeah, where you like, got this what? like you headmaster with what a ruler, <laughs> right? It's like fall in line. The The original point of, uh, of schools was not about creativity and innovation. It's about everybody getting on the same page. Right, so we right. can, you know, yeah. we can all speak the same language and we can all, but yeah, you know, uh, I think they're big bureaucracies mm. like this is a this is not an easy challenge just to switch that's why you do see some tech leaders like when i want to learn how much do i learn from youtube in the last five years so much there's so many practical things about things you, you know, can use every day things you can use so like you know the education is out there and these old educational institutions are very bureaucratic you know they're big organizations government funded there's these things with tenure and all these rules and regulation so they don't move super fast for me it's so cool being associated with this club based on innovation because we're all volunteers there's no accountability in a, in a sense of uh so we can so it, we are a very creative place at the, at the fuse collective it's a student run and, and they do different things every year there's some continuity to it um but yeah there, there's pockets there's pockets of uh places that are a lot of creativity because it's not just the fuse collective we're one club but there is um an incredible amount of creativity you know in different pos pockets but there's also this kind of like old guard hierarchy and rigidity to things like testing mm. you know that's a big one that you know so, so, 
um, and, or even just the whole memorization thing I mentioned before. So there's <laughs> some space for creativity and, and some of it still really is like, yeah, it's the as, furthest thing from yeah, right? yeah. It's like why are we still uh, living like we live in Athens, like back in the days when now we're you know that's a world that's far behind us. We don't even think like that anymore. Um, so there was something else that you wanted to talk about that you have this enormous passion for and. Yeah, would you care to share with us? Sure, yeah, as if the education, innovation in education wasn't big and big enough, wasn't difficult to challenge enough. Uh, just even broader than that, I feel like um, it kind of relates to, to, I, to both topics of energy getting more sustainable and education getting a bit more fit for purpose for the real life. Right. Um, a lot of these things are really impacted by how we govern ourselves through our democracy, right? So whether it's the actual formal rules of the, that the government lays down or whether it's all of our, all the citizens, how they feel about it and how they get to interact. I just have a great respect for um, how we govern ourselves. And I think there's a lot, speaking of things that have, are a couple hundred years old that could change a little bit, could adapt a little bit. I think there's a great opportunity in our modern democracies to be a bit more inclusive and a bit more um, interactive. You know, the, and, and, and I think it would, I don't know how though. I think it, I, I want to bring it up on your podcast because I don't know how to solve this at all. Right. But I, but I feel like, you know, the media is, is, is great, but it, they can be a bit, um, you know, it's been tougher and tougher to afford to be a journalist. And so they get a bit sensational. I was really happy with the advent of social media. It kind of democratized right. the fact that we can all be kind of reporters now, but I don't think the system's set up. The system's more set up to be even more superficial and even more, you know, polarizing. And so... I feel like our social media and our media in general is just kind of like in their teenage years mm -hmm. and I'm really looking forward to it maturing um, and, and potentially helping our democracy, which is, which is so old and, and, you know, the way people currently get to complain about politics on social media right. isn't very constructive, you know? So imagine there was a social media platform um, that was say potentially run by the government or that was designed in a way that actually instead of elevating the most uh, sensational or confrontational um, topics, you know, they actually tried to find solutions, try and bring people to common ground on things, which, you know, you could, you could galvanize a lot of the population to try and the ones that wanted to impact, um, politics positively, instead of just being disenfranchised and having feel like you have no role in it. Well, if there was a social media site that allowed you to kind of like, say like a shadow government of the people, right. you know, that they got to, this is what we'd like to see as far as the policy. This is what, and then you could dig into the policy specifically. Uh, a couple of social media sites I like are, are Reddit and Quora. Okay. And these are kind of like, they're more like discussion forums and you really elevate ideas rather than just people. You know, I think we, 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 this party system that we have in our democracy where it's us versus them and, and it is a, is a problem in a, in a sense because we're kind of getting torn apart. Um, and then also the fact that it's all due to these leaders and their personalities, there's way too much on these individual people. They're just, they're just one human and it's very tough. So they get vilified. I think, you know, whether it's Trudeau or Trump or Jason Kenney, you know, I hear people just complain about them constantly and, right, right. and, you know, I think it's impossible to be one of these leaders because, uh, and so I, I'd rather use the new modern powers to kind of distribute some of that the responsibility, that responsibility and that power, you know, whenever they, they create these things in Canada, sometimes these citizens coalitions right. and whenever they do, it's not huge news, but whenever you just grab a random smattering of people and actually get them to decide on, on any given topic, I always love what they think. 
You know, they always land on the right thing because common sense prevails instead of these outside interests, whether they're partisan, um, based on a, po a party or, you know, a power of, of re-election. You know, I think democracy is, is fantastic, um, but it's also has a lot of room for improvement. Right. You know, so I see the digital tools and maybe even social media tools as a as another thing that's kind of in the, really powerful in the last decade and i'm curious to see i don't know how to even start with this whether yeah. it, you know maybe it's a major party that could promote something like this there is these pirate parties that do just this in europe um there's other kind of decentralized it, it's starting there's something in switzerland there's something in australia right. that are kind of similar to this but yeah i don't know how it'll play out it's just another space i'm really interested in um, us evolving into and I think it would be really helpful for people actually to be engaged as a citizen because uh, I think so few people are they just get turned off by it and th if you did distribute that responsibility uh, I think we could do incredible things I think it'd, yeah. we'd all feel better you know I think we already do do great but it, there's this kind of like psychic pale over us that we all feel like we're getting ripped off and our government's corrupt and you know, I've traveled to a lot of places and, and I think we have, we're very lucky to have the government we have, but it could still be, I think, drastically improved probably. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, and are you, I know just hearing you say, and I, and I can see the importance in it, but you know that we've been so, like our whole history have been ruled by this government and that person and the other person has always been that one guy whom all the responsibility fall on. True. Are you concerned at all? Uh, because people will be like, yo, whatever he's saying doesn't make any sense to us. Like, are you concerned at all by, you know, what, uh, like for people out there that will think that, you know, probably disagree with you and say, well, what you're saying, that's not the way that we do things. You know, we've always done it this way and we want it to stay that way. We, right? Uh, what, we used to have a mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're suggesting that everybody is a mom and dad in a sense, you right. know, like, are you concerned at all? about? Well, I mean, I'm interested in how it'll transition because mm -hmm. like mom and dad aren't going away anytime soon. You right. know, like our current governments um, are solidified in there and it, they move very slowly. They evolve very slowly. That's why they haven't taken up a lot of this digital tech, you know, and some of it, you know, I talk to my software engineers or you see this latest um, Iowa um, caucus kind of technical snafu where sometimes you try and add a little tech and it actually backfires, right? So it'll only, ha it'll have to be supplemental. And that's what I'm really interested in. How do you even start that? You know, like will, uh, will Facebook and and Google, some someone like that rise to the occasion and maybe... You know, Twitter, the Jack Dorsey, the head of Twitter, says that's what Twitter should be all about, is about good conversations. But I think they could design their platforms a bit better to to make that happen, to facilitate better discussion instead of just sensationalism. Um, so maybe we'll see new ones coming up, you know, like new social media platforms. Or maybe, you know, like I said, with the pirate parties, or maybe there's an opportunity for our current government or a, a current political party to embrace that. Um, technology, so that's happening in, in some other places of the world. Those are the pro or maybe you, can, you know, I don't know how to take action on it. You know, like <laughs> maybe I could. I'm talking about it with people, and people kind of, you know, it's such a big topic, so it's hard to always get to the bottom of it. Or I, I I'm, I want to do something, but I just don't know what. You know, you could start like a a lobbying. You know, it could be a lobbying arm. It could be one, and then and then people could look to it and. And the governments that actually have the power could kind of look to what is the citizens' co consensus on this issue. Right, right, right. Maybe you could do that. So I don't know. I, I'd love, maybe it's an app, you know, that uh, makes you a better citizen. Right. You know, like, why is there not an app that makes you a better citizen, <laughs> right? So if, if you could even, you know, maybe through that app, you could discuss policy. And maybe through that app, you could with way more simply just connect with all of your levels of government you know right. you could talk to your city councilor your 
you know, not talk, but send a message to send information to maybe on aggregate, I'll send information to your provincial MLA, your federal MP in, in an easy way, you know, and then, the, you know, if there's an app for that, you know, make it, make it easy for people to engage, you That's know? True. So, but I, I don't, I don't know about how to start a, a, you know, so I'm interested in this space. I don't know where it's going. I don't know. But I just thought to, I'd bring it up because yeah. why not? And, and I just feel like, I, I feel like you did it because, you know, sometimes the person with the idea isn't always the one who actually put the boot on the ground and make things happen. Totally. The ideas come and then someone else picks it up. So I think in as much as you discredit yourself for saying, I don't know how to do it, but I think you did it because somebody watching this or listening to this would be like, oh, you know what? I'm thinking along that line. Uh, maybe I have an idea or two. And that's typically how you get the whole uh, wheel spinning here. Totally. So, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the fact that you've come on here and, you know, want to uh, share these great ideas and these um, and your opinion on where our world is today in terms of uh, sustainable energy and where, we're, where we need to be going and also, you know, innovation and education, where we need where we are, where we need to be going, where we're coming from, mm -hmm. um, I think is immensely um, important. Because, you know, we are here now. I think when we first met, it was like, I really do care about social issues. Like, we need to, we're great, but we can be greater. Sure. Together. Mm -hmm. We don't have to, you don't have to be great all by yourself anymore. On these issues, it's definitely not about one person. It's about all society, right? And, <laughs> yeah. And it's pretty crazy. It's going back to just that gratefulness thing. Another crazy thing about our lives is we get to see so much change throughout our lives, right? Like, like I said, it was someone 200, 2000 years ago, it's pretty static, mm -hmm. you know? So it's empowering that we could, you know, I could have me to you randomly pitch it to the audience, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, this conversation is probably happening in a thousand different places, I hope, right? you know, already, but you know, somebody is going to, you know, in Silicon Valley, they say that ideas aren't even worth anything anymore. It's all about who takes action on it. There you have it. And so maybe someone out there can, uh, or maybe I'll figure out a way to, uh, It'll come. You know, some <laughs> random combination <laughs> of, of things. But I think it's something that's coming broadly. And I'm, I'm happy to just sit back and watch it happen. I hope, I hope we'll get a bit more civil, um, you know, political discussions because it's so important and uh and then if i can play any part in it i'm also happy to to be part of it That's whether wonderful. inspiration or even just literally trying to figure it out you know like i don't mind putting work and it'd be a it'd be a really cool problem to kind of try and tackle yeah. although it's just so big it's so so giant that one's <laughs> tough to wrap your arms around yeah. You know, and I have to say, man, I, I don't think I've met a bigger champion for volunteer than you. I've, I mean, it's been a couple of years since I ever volunteered for anything. Um, but to, to see you and you being so involved and being such a champion for volunteer just make me sort of like wonder, wow, how many opportunities have I missed out on because I didn't want to, or I didn't want to volunteer or that I didn't seek out. Uh, volunteering opportunities because I remember one of my first biggest opportunities that I talked to you about was that you know the whole YMCA thing. If I hadn't gone there, I wouldn't have opened other doors and things like that to all of the other incredible people that I met and the opportunity that came along with that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I just want to thank you for that. And uh, yeah, any any final words? Uh, I don't think so. No, just a pleasure meeting, uh, you know, a brother from an another country. Another country, know? that's I right. I mean, it, <laughs> you know, we, I do, I felt the same thing about you, just that energy. And I, I, I see you as well, just, you know, putting yourself out there, trying to make a difference in the world yeah. and seeing where it goes, right? You have to be kind of vulnerable. For, for me, like, you just don't know. That's the amazing thing about the world is there's just, you don't know the future. And so just there's so much opportunity out there and it's where you put your attention, where you put your focus. So Absolutely. I'm really happy to meet up with you a second time <laughs> and just kind of see behind the scenes yeah, yeah. of, uh, yeah, of your world and learn a little bit about your history. And yeah, it's just been a pleasure, man. Oh man, it's been such a solid pleasure. And I want to thank you, 
um, for, for tuning in. And I also want to thank the audience as well for, for tuning in and, uh, you know, tuning into the podcast. And I hope that you learned something from the podcast. Also, I just quickly want to say, if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you subscribe to the channel, share the ideas. Uh, it's not just enough to watch something. Also, make sure you comment as well. Uh, it's not so much about agreeing or disagreeing. We can agree and disagree as long as we come up to with a solution. I think that's what's important. So we want to thank you. Uh, and again, give it up to our host. Uh, sorry. <laughs> give it up to our guest, uh, Ryan Richardson, uh, for being here. Thank you so much, Ryan. This has been such a great subject. And I thank you for coming in such a short uh, time notice. Hey, my pleasure, Rico. Thank you very much. All right, man. Thank you. Hey, it's me. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and don't forget to hit that notification button so that you may be notified every time we release content every Wednesday. See you next time on 18 Avenue Podcast. <laughs>